At the Earth's Core by Edgar Rice Burroughs 3. A Change of Masters We must have travelled several miles through the dark and dismal wood when we came suddenly upon a dense village built high among the branches of the trees. As we approached it, my escort broke into wild shouting, which was immediately answered from within, and a moment later a swarm of creatures of the same strange race as those who had captured me poured out to meet us. Again I was the centre of a wildly chattering horde. I was pulled this way and that, pinched, pounded and thumped until I was black and blue, yet I do not think that their treatment was dictated by either cruelty or malice. I was a curiosity a freak, a new plaything, and their childish minds required the added evidence of all their senses to back up the testimony of their eyes. Presently they dragged me within the village, which consisted of several rude shelters of boughs and leaves supported upon the branches of the trees. Between the huts which sometimes formed crooked streets were dead branches and the trunks of small trees which connected the huts upon one tree to those within adjoining trees, the whole network of huts and pathways forming an almost solid flooring a good fifty feet above the ground. I wondered why these agile creatures required connecting bridges between the trees, but later when I saw the motley aggregation of half-savage beasts which they kept within their village, I realised the necessity for the pathways. There were a number of the same vicious wolf-dogs which we had left worrying the dirith, and many goat-like animals whose distended udders explained the reasons for their presence. My guard halted before one of the huts into which I was pushed, then two of the creatures squatted down before the entrance, to prevent my escape, doubtless, though where I should have escaped to I certainly had not the remotest conception. I had no more than entered the dark shadows of the interior than there fell upon my ears the tones of a familiar voice in prayer. Perry, I cried, dear old Perry, thank the Lord you're safe. David, can it be possible that you escaped? And the old man stumbled toward me and threw his arms about me. He had seen me fall before the Dirith, and then he had been seized by a number of the ape creatures and borne through the treetops to their village. His captors had been as inquisitive as to his strange clothing as had mine, with the same result. As we looked at each other, we could not help but laugh. "'With a tail, David,' remarked Perry, "'you would make a very handsome ape.' "'Maybe we can borrow a couple,' I rejoined. "'They seem to be quite the thing this season. "'I wonder what the creatures intend doing with us, Perry. "'They don't seem really savage.' "'What do you suppose they can be? "'You were about to tell me where we are "'when that great hairy frigate bore down upon us. "'Have you really any idea at all?' "'Yes, David,' he replied. "'I know precisely where we are. "'We have made a magnificent discovery, my boy. "'We have proved that the earth is hollow. "'We have passed entirely through its crust "'to the inner world. "'Harry, you're mad.' "'Not at all, David. "'For two hundred and fifty miles "'our prospector bore us through the crust "'beneath our outer world.' At that point it reached the centre of gravity of the five hundred mile thick crust. Up to that point we had been descending. Direction is, of course, merely relative. Then at the moment that our seats revolved, the thing that made you believe that we had turned about and were speeding upward, we passed the centre of gravity, and though we did not alter the direction of our progress, yet we were in reality moving upward, toward the surface of the inner world. Does not the strange flora and fauna which we have seen convince you that you are not in the world of your birth? and the horizon could it present the strange aspects which we both noted unless we were indeed standing upon the inner surface of a sphere but the sun perry i urged how in the world can the sun shine through five hundred miles of solid crust it is not the sun of the outer world that we see here it is another sun an entirely different sun that casts its eternal noonday effulgence upon the face of the inner world Look at it now, David, if you can see it from the doorway of this hut, and you will see that it is still in the exact centre of the heavens. We have been here for many hours, yet it is still noon. And with all it is very simple, David. The earth was once a nebulous mass. It cooled, and as it cooled, it shrank. At length a thin crust of solid matter formed upon its outer surface, a sort of shell, but within it was partially molten matter and highly expanded gases. As it continued to cool, what happened? Centrifugal force hurled the particles of the nebulous centre towards the crust, as rapidly as they approached a solid state. You have seen the same principle practically applied in the modern cream separator. Presently there was only a small, superheated core of gaseous matter remaining within a huge, vacant interior left by the contraction of the cooling gases. 
The equal attraction of the solid crust from all directions maintained this luminous core in the exact centre of the hollow globe. What remains of it is the sun you saw today, a relatively tiny thing at the exact centre of the earth. Equally to every part of this inner world, it diffuses its perpetual noonday light and torrid heat. This inner world must have cooled sufficiently to support animal life long ages after life appeared on the outer crust, but that the same agencies were at work here is evident from the similar forms of animal and vegetable creation which we have already seen. Take the great beast that attacked us, for example, unquestionably a counterpart of the Megatherium of the post-Pliocene period of the outer crust, whose fossilized skeleton has been found in South America. But the grotesque inhabitants of this forest, I urged, Surely they have no counterpart in the Earth's history? Who can tell, he rejoined. They may constitute the link between ape and man, all traces of which have been swallowed by the countless convulsions which have racked the outer crust. Or they may be merely the result of evolution along slightly different lines. Either is quite possible. Further speculation was interrupted by the appearance of several of our captors before the entrance of the hut. Two of them entered and dragged us forth, the perilous pathways and the surrounding trees were filled with the black ape-men, their females, and their young. There was not an ornament, a weapon, or a garment among the lot. Quite low in the scale of creation, commented Perry. Quite high enough to play the deuce with us, though, I replied. Now what do you suppose they intend doing with us? We were not long in learning. As on the occasion of our trip to the village, we were seized by a couple of the powerful creatures and whirled away through the treetops while about us and in our wake raced a chattering, jabbering, grinning horde of sleek, black ape-things. Twice my bearers missed their footing, and my heart ceased beating as we plunged toward instant death among the tangled deadwood beneath. But on both occasions those lithe, powerful tails reached out and found sustaining branches. Nor did either of the creatures loosen their grip upon me. In fact, it seemed that the incidents were of no greater moment to them than would be the stubbing of one's toe at a street crossing in the outer world. They but laughed uproariously and sped on with me. For some time they continued through the forest. How long I could not guess, for I was learning what was later borne very forcibly to my mind, that time ceases to be a factor, the moment means for measuring it cease to exist. Our watches were gone, and we were living beneath a stationary sun. Already I was puzzled to compute the period of time which had elapsed since we broke through the crust of the inner world. It might be hours, or it might be days. Who in the world could tell where it was always noon? By the sun no time had elapsed, but my judgment told me that we must have been several hours in this strange world. Presently the forest terminated, and we came out upon a level plain. A short distance before us rose a few low, rocky hills. Towards these our captors urged us, and after a short time led us through a narrow pass into a tiny circular valley. Here they got down to work, and we were soon convinced that if we were not to die to make a Roman holiday, we were to die for some other purpose. The attitude of our captors altered immediately as they entered the natural arena within the rocky hills. Their laughter ceased. Grim ferocity marked their bestial faces. Bared fangs menaced us. We were placed in the centre of the amphitheatre, the thousand creatures forming a great ring about us. Then a wolf-dog was brought, Hyenodon, Perry called it, and turned loose with us inside the circle. The thing's body was as large as that of a full-grown mastiff, its legs were short and powerful, and its jaws broad and strong. Dark, shaggy hair covered its back and sides, while its breast and belly were quite white. As it slunk towards us, it presented a most formidable aspect, with its upcurled lips bearing its mighty fangs. Perry was on his knees, praying. I stooped and picked up a small stone. At my movement, the beast veered off a bit and commenced circling us. Evidently, it had been a target for stones before. The ape things were dancing up and down, urging the brute on with savage cries, until at last, seeing that I did not throw, he charged us. As I prepared to throw, I held my nerves and muscles under absolute command, though the grinning jaws were hurtling toward me at terrific speed, and then... I let go with every ounce of my weight and muscle and science in the back of that throw. The stone caught the hyenodon full upon the end of the nose and sent him bowling over upon his back. At the same instant, a chorus of shrieks and howls arose from the circle of spectators, so that for a moment I thought that the upsetting of their champion was the cause. But in this I soon saw that I was mistaken. As I looked, the ape things broke in all directions towards the surrounding hills, and then I distinguished the real cause of their perturbation. Behind them, streaming through the pass which leads into the valley, there came a swarm of hairy men, gorilla-like creatures armed with spears and hatchets and bearing long oval shields. 
Like demons, they set upon the eight things, and before them the hyenodon, which had now regained its senses and its feet, fled howling with fright. Pastors swept the pursued and the pursuers, nor did the hairy ones accord us more than a passing glance, until the arena had been emptied of its former occupants. Then they returned to us, and one who seemed to have authority among them directed that we be brought with them. When we passed out of the amphitheatre onto the great plain, we saw a caravan of men and women, human beings like ourselves, and for the first time hope and relief filled my heart, until I could have cried out in the exuberance of my happiness. It is true that they were a half-naked, wild-appearing aggregation, but they at least were fashioned along the same lines as ourselves. There was nothing grotesque or horrible about them as about the other creatures in this strange, weird world. But as we came closer, our hearts sank once more, for we discovered that the poor wretches were chained neck to neck in a long line, and the gorilla men were their guards. With little ceremony, Perry and I were chained at the end of the line, and without further ado, the interrupted march was resumed. Up to this time, the excitement had kept us both up, but now the tiresome monotony of the long march across the sun-baked plain brought on all the agonies consequent to a long-denied sleep. On and on we stumbled beneath that hateful noonday sun. If we fell, we were prodded with a sharp point. Our companions in chains did not stumble. They strode along, proudly erect. Occasionally they would exchange words with one another in a monosyllabic language. They were a noble-appearing race, with well-formed heads and perfect physiques. The men were heavily bearded, tall and muscular, the women smaller and more gracefully moulded, with great masses of raven hair caught into loose knots upon their heads. The features of both sexes were well proportioned. There was not a face among them that would have been called even plain if judged by earthly standards. They wore no ornaments, but this I later learned was due to the fact that their captors had stripped them of everything of value. As garmenture, the women possessed a single robe of some light-coloured, spotted hide, rather similar in appearance to a leopard skin. This they wore either supported entirely about the waist by a leather thong, so that it hung partially below the knee on one side, or possibly looped gracefully across one shoulder. Their feet were shod with skin sandals. The men wore loincloths of the hide of some shaggy beast, long ends of which depended before and behind nearly to the ground. In some instances these ends were finished with the strong talons of the beast from which the hides had been taken. Our guards, whom I already have described as gorilla-like men, were rather lighter in build than a gorilla, but even so they were indeed mighty creatures. Their arms and legs were proportioned more in conformity with human standards, but their entire bodies were covered with shaggy brown hair, and their faces were quite as brutal as those of the few stuffed specimens of the gorilla which I had seen in the museums at home. Their only redeeming feature lay in the development of the head above and back of the ears. In this respect, they were not one whit less human than we. They were clothed in a sort of tunic of light cloth, which reached to the knees. Beneath this, they wore only a loincloth of the same material, while their feet were shod with thick hide of some mammoth creature of this inner world. Their arms and necks were encircled by many ornaments of metal, silver predominating, and on their tunics were sewn the heads of tiny reptiles in odd and rather artistic designs. They talked among themselves as they marched along on either side of us, but in a language which I perceived differed from that employed by our fellow prisoners. When they addressed the latter they used what appeared to be a third language, and which I later learned is a mongrel tongue rather analogous to pidgin English. How far we marched I have no conception, nor has Perry. Both of us were asleep much of the time for hours before a halt was called, then we dropped in our tracks. I say for hours, but how may one measure time when time does not exist? When our march commenced, the sun stood at zenith. When we halted, our shadows still pointed towards Nadir. Whether an instant or an eternity of earthly time elapsed, who may say? That march may have occupied nine years and eleven months of the ten years that I spent in the inner world, or it may have been accomplished in the fraction of a second. I cannot tell. But this I do know, that since you have told me that ten years have elapsed since I departed from this earth, I have lost all respect for time. I am commencing to doubt that such a thing exists other than in the weak, finite mind of man.